All right, Melanie, I think we can start now. After you. Okay. So just one quick reminder again, uh, participants, please rename yourself to your registered name to ease the registration process. So I'll begin now. Good morning, afternoon, evening to everyone around the world. Welcome to the second session of MSGA Academy Financial Literacy Series, the investment session. And the title for our content today is called how a robot advisor can help you invest. And the list of topics can be seen in the slide shown. Before we start, here are some house rules to follow. Next slide, please. Please remember to mute your microphones throughout the session to prevent disturbance for other participants. You may turn on your webcam and it is advisable to insert your questions in the Slido link provided in your email or the link in the chat box. Please be patient with technical difficulties and enjoy and learn. Lastly, please remember again to rename yourself. So without a further ado, let me welcome the speaker for today. To give you a brief introduction of the speaker, Waikun graduated with a degree in economics and finance from University of um, UNSW Australia before working as an investment associate at Kazana National. He played a role in the post-merger integration between Afin Holdings and Huang Investment Bank in 2014 when he was only 26. He took part in landmark transactions such as initial public offering of Serba Dynamic. He climbed his way from Senior Assistant Vice President in Corporate Strategy at Afin Huang Capital to being the Vice President of Equity Capital Markets, spending over four years at Afin Huang. And he became the Country Manager for Malaysia at Stash Away when Stash Away was just setting up its office in KL up till today. So, Mr. Wong, the stage is yours. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much, Faris and Melanie, for putting this together. I'm just going to start sharing my screen now so that we can begin. So I guess with every, with every speaker series, you'll have a, a, a bio data, right, that, that goes through the person's profile and all that. And, and I think the main purpose for you guys to to look at profiles like this is to not just go, oh, okay, this, this speaker is going to be good, it's going to be exciting, stuff to learn, that kind of thing. But also, obviously, I think it, it shows you all the kind of options that there are out there in the finance industry. And I can say that having been in, in traditional banking, in corporate, and now in, in a startup, like a fintech company like Stashway, I can say that it's very different, it's very fun. And... By the time you guys graduate, there'll be more fintech companies, more digital companies for you to consider. And the best thing is that tech is so mainstream that your parents won't be disappointed in you if you actually join a tech company. Right? You say, I joined Grab, I joined Lazada, I joined Stash Away. They'll know what it is, right? So, so then you won't get any resistance and, 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 and things like that. So like Melanie mentioned, um, and I'm, I'm just going through my, my experience to, to give you a better idea about what I did and how I got here. And it's not really to, not really to gloat or anything. Um, it's, it's more to show you what is beyond the title, right? Like the title is, is, is titles are there, but you wonder, right, on a day-to-day -day basis what we really do. Um, so here, here's how I started. And then, you know, you can think about it, whether that excites you or not, and whether it presents itself as an option for you in the future especially if you're a finance student, right? Like I, I want you guys to be, to be excited about the future, you know? So um, yeah, I started in Kazana. Kazana is Malaysia's sovereign wealth fund. It, ha it has in its stable, you know, huge companies that you might recognize, you know, like CIB, Asiata, but also companies that you may not know are under Kazana. Things, assets like, um, like Legoland, you know, we have a movie studio in Iskanda, uh, luxury resorts in, in, in Langkawi. Um, also, you know, trouble companies like Malaysian Airlines, right? All of this are under Kazana's banner. 
And your job as an as an investment analyst is to is to help these companies uh, do well. You know, help them in business operations, help them in strategy, and you can also make new investments on behalf of Fazana if there's something attractive out there to actually invest in. So I, I did that for a couple of years, but then there was a really exciting opportunity elsewhere where two investment banks were going to merge and I was going to join my, my old boss who I did an internship with back in the day. And he was a great boss and ultimately, you know, it was quite an easy decision to go from a, a, a big name like Kazana to actually to Afin, right? Like a lot of people thought I was crazy, but it's not so much just the, the name of the company, but what is your role that you can play within this company as well, right? So I joined Afin who was merging with Huang and ultimately, the entity that you, you may know as Afin Huang today came from that merger. And corporate strategy is a very interesting role, right? Because you're not actually doing finance roles per se, you know, you're not dispersing loans, you're not doing deals. But what you're doing is you are charting the cost for the, the company to, to grow now that it has merged, right? So, so that means a lot of contact with people in the C-suite, a lot of contact with head of departments so that you can actually do, do things that the banks have, that that bank hasn't done before, right? So either going into new businesses, being more aggressive, um, we call them strategic initiatives, you know, things that help the bank grow now that it has reached a new scale, right? Because it has, it has merged. Um, and then after a few years of doing that, I decided that I wanted to actually start doing deals. And then I went to the, the actual business unit called Equity Capital Markets. Equity Capital Markets is a department which helps companies go public. So, you know, we help companies list on Bursa. It's a very, very long and tedious process, but ultimately the aim is to help companies raise money, right? In, 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 in business, you can raise debt, you can raise equity, and then my job was to actually help them raise equity. Um, very exciting. Um, some of the companies that we have have actually brought public have done very well since then going public is not the end going going public is just a, a milestone so the company can get more money have a bigger valuation and then ultimately uh, go on and do bigger things around the region and around the world so i was very happy there and then i my friend told me about this company called stash away in singapore that was doing very well and they were expanding into malaysia and i didn't really think too much about it because it was just too new, it was too startup y and I was like very happy being in a, in, a, in a corporate setting. But then I did some research and I found that, oh, wow, these companies, this, this company is actually very legit. They, they, they've, uh, they, they have their license from the Monetary Authority of Singapore. They, uh, they have raised a, a good amount of money. So I, I got curious enough to start talking to the founders and all of them were great. There were three co-founders the R3 co-founders and I spoke to all of them and they were not just some of the smartest people that I've ever met but also one some of the nicest and and most excited about the opportunity at, at hand right it's, a, it's also a message to you guys when you go to an interview and the person in front of you is someone that you really aspire to to work with to be that's a very good sign that, that you, you should really think about this company. The company might not have the biggest brand in the world. Stashery did not have a brand three years ago. It does now, right? But you can play a big role in terms of building it, right? So, so I like to think like, even though I started at a very big company and they've gotten progressively smaller and smaller, I've, I've actually uh, progressed in my career, right? I've actually gotten to do uh, more and more and have more responsibility. And that's actually how I, I've gotten to where I am today. So just to sum it up, there's, don't think about banking and, and, and finance as just like one vertical. Okay, I'm going to be an investment banker. I'm going to go into commercial banking. Don't think about it in that sense. There's a lot of disruption happening, a lot of exciting things that you can be part of as well. Okay? So when Faris and his team reached out to, to me, um, at, you know, because the name of the, the, the topic was financial literacy and it was for students, I actually thought that okay, maybe I want to talk about some 101, some basics, some investments uh, uh, introduction, right? But then this week I thought, when I was a student, I was actually smarter than, than myself when I was working with regards to all the theory that was going on. So I thought that I wanted to actually give you guys a little bit more of a 
intermediate level type of talk about stash away and how we actually build portfolios, how we manage people's money. And I know that you guys are uni, all the concepts are still very fresh, but as, as the organizers have told me, if at any time they feel like uh, some concepts are alien to you guys or you want a refresher, you can just, uh, they'll, they'll prompt me and then I can, I'll be more than happy to, to explain. We also have quite a bit of time today, so I don't want to rush things as well. Okay, so getting on with it, um, hope you didn't mind that grandfather story, but essentially that tells you a little bit about myself, so I think it serves today's content as well. I guess I've been through this. So um, this, this slide is a snapshot from SC's public register. It's actually a bit of a PSA because there are a lot of new firms out there, a lot of digital companies, digital companies that may be good, but actually not registered in Malaysia. And it's really buyer beware, right? So if you, if you or your parents ever hear about a new company looking to raise funds, looking to get investments from people, and you don't know whether this company is legit or not, just go to this website over here and type in the, the company name and you will actually get to see whether they are licensed or not, right? So another, another rule of thumb is that whoever talks to you about money, besides the individual, the firm that they represent needs to be to be legitimate as well, right? So I, if, if I was working for Afid Huang uh, as an investment banker and I, and I came to you and said, hey, I want to talk to you about personal finance, that wouldn't really be right because while I know a thing or two about deals, I may not know a thing or two about your investments and your personal finance. So you need to know whether the person and the firm is actually credible or not. And, and this is one easy way to do just that. Okay. So I didn't want to go into the, the, the tech stuff and all, all, the, all the, the, the ways that we manage money as such without giving you a very broad overview about what investments is and, and all the different asset classes that are out there available to you. So last week, Steve would have already gave, given you guys a bit of an overview, I'm sure. So I think the, the, the message here is really that in life, there's, there's five main, main asset classes. There's equities, there's bonds, there's commodities, there's real estate, and there's cash. And of course, there are alternatives as well, things like crypto, uh, things like fine art, wine, all those stuff to invest in. The main big five are, are here. And I think before you look at investing in, in really newfangled stuff like NFTs and all that, you should really have a core portfolio which has all of this put together. All of these different asset classes serve different purposes from a risk-reward point of view. The point is not to jump from one asset class to another, from one stock to another and hope that it does well. You should really be forming a portfolio that is quite balanced so that at any one point in time, if the markets tank like it did last, last March, last April, then you're actually not that severely impacted and you can, you can continue investing for the long term because that's really where the big bucks are. Long-term investing might seem a bit boring compared to short-term trading, but long-term investing means that in tough times, your portfolio won't go down as much because it's diversified. And because of that, it recovers faster. And because it recovers faster, your portfolio gets to compound on its positive uh, gains and as you know, compound interest is a very, very powerful force. And if I gave you the choice today of having 1 million, or if I give you 1 cent, but that 1 cent will double in value every day, right? At, the, at, at day 30, which one is bigger, right? So actually, 1 cent doubling every day would be much bigger than, than 1 million today. So in 30 days, your one cent will be around like the, around 3 million, you know, because it doubles every day. And essentially that shows you the power of compounding interest, right? And it's just something that is hard to visualize because people, humans think in a linear way, not an exponential way. And because of that, you know, you're, you should always have a long-term view. You should always have diversified portfolio like this. And having a portfolio like this helps you stay in the game and not get too emotional and have to sell straight away, right? So, so that's, that having good habits is really more important than like, oh, should I pick this stock? Should I pick that stock? Okay. So speaking about risk return, 
each asset class has its own risk return. So the, there's a cliche that says, you know, high risk, high return, which is actually only half the truth because it's actually only high risk, high return on average and in the long term. So if you hold a high risk asset class, let's say like a small cap stock for one month, it may tank, it may go from 20 cents to 10 cents. And it's not assured that you will definitely get a high return because you have taken more risk. This high risk, high return cliche is really built on the aggregate and all of these asset classes together in long term, 15, 20 years, and only on average. So this might represent like all the, all the stocks in, in the world, all the stocks in Malaysia, and they are only high risk, high return because, uh, in the long run. And, you, and in the meantime, they are, the variance of their returns will be very huge. One day it could be here, one day it could be here. Unlike stocks, real estate and bonds are a lot more stable. So because of that, your portfolio should be around here, right? And because of that, you really want to have a mix of everything, right? Because you, even with equities, you don't just want, okay, I just want US equities, for example. It's, you know, you really need to spread your bets around so that it becomes less volatile. And because it's less volatile, it's easier for you to hold on. Imagine if you had just one stock and it did this all the time, you would emotionally also be linked to your portfolio. And when it goes up, you feel very greedy. When it goes down, you feel very anxious, very worried, very scared. And you may not know what to do at any one point in time, right? So instead of buying high and selling low, uh, but, uh, sorry, buying low and selling high, you might do the, the opposite, right? Where you, where you actually think you want to buy low, sell high, but when you bought it, you might be buying it on an emotional high because you read something good about it. And then when, it, when the share price tanks, you're like, okay, I've lost faith. Um, this company that I bought, I, I don't love it anymore. And then you sell when you're down, right? So that happens to a lot of people. And actually, when you when you read studies on um, on on retail stock stock broking, sixty to ninety percent of people who have stock broking accounts actually lose money, right? So so why would you do that? It's because actually a lot of people go into stock the stock market without learning a thing or two, and they're basically just gambling. And when they when they gamble and they lose. They just leave the casino, right? So I'm not saying that stock picking is bad. I'm just saying that you really need to be disciplined. You really need to have a method in order to, to be, to, to play the game for a very long time. Yeah. Okay. So a bit about returns as well. Don't know if you can see until the bottom here. So all asset classes will have risk and return, right? And, and here is the return. And the way you should look at returns is on a per annum basis and preferably on a long-term basis. So if someone says to you, oh, wow, well, this, this asset did uh, 50%, then you, you should ask 50% over how long and um, what is the long and what is, what is the per annum return, right? So if they tell you, oh, this did 50% since I bought it, bought it when? Five years ago. Okay, then you need to do your CAGR calculation to see, oh, actually it's, it, it, it's around 10% a year, right? Okay, fine. So don't let big returns being illustrated tempt you because you really need to standardize your decision-making. So you need to know, okay, this thing has done 6% over the last 10 years per annum, okay? If you don't know that, then you're really like, you're, you're really all over the place and you don't know whether something is good or bad. So another way to benchmark is to look at what FDs are giving you right now. You may or may not be, be putting your money in FDs today, but FDs are giving you around 1.8% return. And that's what you can get and expect for no risk at all, right? So if you take no risk, you can only expect 1.8%. So if someone comes to you and says, hey, I've got this potential investment opportunity that could give you 5%. Right, so five percent is better than two percent. The next thing you should ask yourself is, oh, what kind of risk am I taking? What's my potential downside? Right, so different people will be able to tell you what risk you're taking or not. But if you ask the right questions and they give you the right data, then you can actually figure out for yourself whether it it is um, worth the risk or not. So, for example, with with regards to risk, there's all kinds of metrics that you can ask in order to get 
a benchmark, either something like a Sharpe ratio or something like uh, 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 volatility or value at risk. Some opportunities give you this data, some may not. But one very easy way of, of looking at whether you want to participate in this or not is to look at the historical uh, uh, returns and look at the price chart and see what's the maximum downside from, from top to bottom. So let's say in March and April last year, it was, it was down 30%. Then you ask yourself, am I willing to hold on to something that could go down 30%? It's really up to you. It doesn't mean that the thing is bad or not. It just means that it, it, it just tests you whether you are willing to hold on to this thing uh, for when it goes down 30% or not. Okay, so that's one way of assessing the downside. And let's look at the, the, the ranking here in terms of what did well and what didn't do well over the last 10 years. So US equities reg regularly return 10 to 11% per year. That's the whole S&P 500. Uh, gold has done very well over the last two years, but this year it hasn't done very well. But because of last two years, it, it rose over 20%. You can see that from a risk reward standpoint, gold has done very well. Normally, gold should give you around 4%. I, I took a 20 year average and, and the, the return is only 4%. But because last two years, it did very well in, in the last 10 years, uh, it has done 7%. So it's really outperformed, so to speak. EPF, which you guys will contribute to at some point in time, has given an average of 6%. The latest one is around 5%. Uh, real estate also 5%. Asian equities is, is tricky because in good times, they do very well. In bad times, they do terribly. And because of that, the risk return may, may, not, may not have been there in the last 10 years. But who's to say that uh, the ascendancy of China and the, the exciting economies in, in Asia won't do very well over the next 10 years, right? So, so that's the thing you really need to diversify. Bonds, because of low interest rates, are down 2%, right? So, so you can see this whole risk return spectrum here. And again, like I said, the point is to have a diversified portfolio because you don't know which returns will be great over the next 10 years. So if you look at which asset class did well over the last 10 years, every year is a different asset class. One year, it might be large cap stocks. One year, it might be tech stocks. One year, it might be gold. One year, it might be, might be bonds. Whatever it is, you can't pick one because you don't know what's going to happen. Right? You could be lucky for one year, but you can't be lucky for like 10 years in a row. Okay, so moving on, I think the easiest way to, to figure out what stash away is, is to really compare it to, to uh, unit trust, right? And unit trust is essentially a fund, a fund of uh, different asset classes in it, or, or a fund of just one type of asset class in it. But essentially, it's a fund, and stash away is, is a fund manager as well. So if you think about it as a digital unit trust or a digital fund manager, then you'll be able to, to understand broadly what we do. We are not a broker. We are not a cryptocurrency provider or whatever. We, we are a fund manager. So if you give us money, we will invest it in, in, in a fund that you have chosen. And then when you want to sell, we will would, we would return to you your principal and gains or losses. So it is not a... We're not a broker where we just help you buy and sell stocks. We're not, uh, we're not a payments company. We're not a remittance company. You know, I, I think the easiest way to compare us is to think of us as a digital unit trust or digital fund manager. And because we're digital, there's a whole bunch of uh, advantages, which I won't go through in, in detail over here, but because we use tech as opposed to real life uh, ways of reaching the customer, you know, we can actually charge a lot cheaper. And that's why if you look at a lot of digital companies out there, they have a slight advantage when it comes to cost because, uh, because being digital helps you reduce a lot of the unnecessary costs. Instead of having to, to hire a lot of agents and a lot of people to sell it to you um, and, and, and branches to serve you, we just have an online presence. We have an app, we have a, a web presence. And because of that, it's mostly self-service. And because of that, we get to reduce the cost and share the benefits with, with our investors. So if you do the comparison here between um, buying a traditional unit trust and also or using a robot advisor like Stashway, you will see by and large the cost differential is very, very huge. Uh, digital companies are definitely able to, to charge much less. Okay. All right.
And low fees is actually a very important thing in investing, regardless of whether you use a robo advisor or not. Because the, again, like the power of compound interest, like I mentioned before, is a huge force that you should, you should take note of. And if we had an example here of two investments where you contribute the same amount and you get the same gross return, it's just that the fees are different. So, you know, one, 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 on one hand, you've got, you've got low fees and on another hand, you've got high fees. You will see that in the, in the long term, actually the, the difference is, is massive, right? It's around 600,000 and something, you know, 6% compounding versus 4%. Compounding versus three percent is very very different. So that is the only, uh, the only thing that's different in terms of the fees. And because of that, your results after many years will be huge, right? So in the beginning, it might not seem a lot. One side has two percent, one side has one percent fees. But in the long term, is is actually huge. But the fee differential is something you should always calculate. Um, you should always ask the pro provider what the fees are so that you can compare apples to apples as well. If you are looking to use a, a, a brokerage platform, make sure that they charge based on percentage. Uh, sorry, not, not percentage. Uh, make sure they charge based on like a flat fee that's preferable versus a percentage, right? If you charge using a flat fee, then every time you trade, it's only like five ringgit, right? But if you charge based on a percentage, you will pay more the more you invest, right? So that's that's very, um, that's that's not cost efficient. So, I, I I think I've made my point that actually cost is a very important factor, especially when you look at long term uh, returns that you would have gotten if you just had invested in a low cost provider. Okay, so I get the chance to speak to a lot of people in Malaysia about their money and, and by and large, their portfolios really look like this. It's very, very messy, very, very rojak, right? Because essentially people go through life just collecting financial products. They don't go through life investing, really. They don't really know what they're actually investing in and they have a real imbalance in terms of what they should and shouldn't have. And they do just what people tell them to do and they get sold things that agents sell them and they do it for the wrong reasons. So you can see that this whole setup is all over the place. It's, you know, the moment the truck moves, everything is going to fall down, right? So I think that as, as, a, as someone who, who is educated, your job is not to collect financial products. Your job is to invest. And everything that you see here as a, as a, as a, as a financial product has an actual investment exposure whether it's into equities, whether it's into bonds or whatever, whatever it is, you need to know your consolidated position and you should buy financial products that, that suit what you're trying to do. So for example, if you know, if you are, if you're, let's say your, your asset allocation right now is already very balanced, you're taking very balanced risk and you decide to take on more risk, you should actually um, buy more equities or equity ETFs to add to this so you can be more aggressive, right? Not just going through life going, oh, my auntie is selling me this bond fund. Sounds good. Okay, I'll just buy it. You don't really know what's going on. Your friend who's just started working very gung ho trying to sell you investment link insurance, just buy because it's good protection, right? You don't really know what's going on. So rather than this, doing this, you your ultimate portfolio should really look like this, where it's much more streamlined, much more a much more methodical way of investing. And you don't really have to change much actually because actually you just have to realize that underneath all the financial products that you've bought, there actually is some um, investment exposure. So if you have EPF, if you have ASB, if you have bought a few stocks, if you use a robo advisor like StashAway, all of them will have investment exposure and you need to know at a holistic basis, what is your actual asset allocation or investment exposure at any one point in time? And you should ask yourself, is this the right amount of risk I should be taking? As a relatively young person, your risk is not taking enough risk, especially when you start working. When you start working, you're going to contribute towards uh, EPF. 
you might get into some ASB, your parents might kind of give you some ASB. Um, and, and those are actually quite safe. And because they're quite safe, you can actually maximize your expected return by investing more in not just equities, but actually more riskier equities just to get the kind of risk that you want. As a relatively young person, very far, very far away from retirement, 30, 40 years from retirement, you should really have, uh, have more risk. So because of that, you should know where you stand at any one point in time. You should know what your asset allocation is. You should know underneath the financial product that you've bought is actual investment exposure, which is the most important thing. And because of that, you should know where you stand holistically, right? So happy to go into any one of these asset classes or how exactly to do that if you, if you guys are curious, okay? So like I said, asset allocation, very important. In when you have an investment professional show up to work, they don't just ask themselves, what stock should I buy today? They ask themselves, what is my asset allocation for this fund? What risk am I going to take? And how much money should I put in one asset class over the other? So asset allocation is like 80% equities, 20% bonds, right? So that decision of putting 80% equities uh, versus 20% bonds is actually more important than choosing what stock to buy actually. Yeah, so you should focus on your big picture as opposed to the nitty gritty stock, stock selection, especially when you are starting out. When you're starting out, you should figure out what's your overall asset allocation before you start picking stocks, okay? If you want to be a little bit nerdy, you can find, you'll, you'll find out as well that, that if you run a regression on what explains uh, returns, what decisions explain returns, you will find out that all these studies point to asset allocation and the fact that 80% of these returns are attributed to your asset allocation decision, right? So to put it very crudely, if let's say you bought the S&P 500, the, the US stock market, all of it, right? All 500 stocks in it. And, and the US stock market gave you 8%, okay? And then you bought one stock, let's say you bought Netflix, and Netflix gave you 10%. You might think from a security selection point of view that you have made a better decision. 10% is bigger than 8%, right? But anything could have happened to Netflix, right? Subsequent numbers could be less than exciting and it may actually stumble and the, 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 the share price could, could fall. But when you look at the whole market, the market's not gonna just plummet like that unless it's like a, a bear market. And even then, you know that the, the whole market is not going to go bankrupt. So 8% with, which, which is really diversified is better than 10% of a single stock. And because of your asset allocation decision to buy all of the US market, the S&P 500, you would have made a better decision in terms of getting that, that ultimate return, say, 8%, then actually choosing just one stock, okay? So if you want, the, 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 the study is actually conducted by, by CFA, and there's another study conducted by BlackRock, and, and they say the same thing. Asset allocation decisions are actually very important, okay? So um, another reason why you can actually see that, that, um, Asset allocation is important is because a lot of fund managers who pick stocks actually don't outperform their benchmarks over a long period of time. And the reason why this is important is because when you give your money to an active fund manager who tries to pick the right stocks to beat their benchmark, you are actually paying them more. You're paying them more than actually just doing it yourself. And if you pay them more, you expect them to do what they say they're going to do, which is to beat their benchmark. So if they don't beat their benchmark, you are better off not paying them so high fees and actually using more passive, um, more passive instruments like ETFs to actually build your own portfolios and, and, and manage it that way. 
So you can see here that this data comes from S&P, large cap US fund managers underperform their benchmarks over like 90%. Over 90% of them don't over outperform their benchmarks. And it's the same across mid cap funds, small cap funds over 15 years. So if you invest for long term and you pay someone a lot of money, say 5% sales charge and 2% management fees. So like the 7%, you pay them 7% of your gross returns, you will see that a lot of them still don't outperform their benchmarks. Okay. And while this is not the same all around the world, it's largely the same. In developed markets, fund managers rarely beat their benchmarks on a, on a consistent basis. Uh, in, in less developed markets like India and, and perhaps even Malaysia, companies have a better chance of, uh, fund, fund managers have a better chance of beating their benchmark just because of information. And in, in, the, in the US and all that, they have very, very strong laws about insider trading and enforcement. Whereas in Malaysia, it's actually very lax and it's a bit of an open secret that, you know, information gets, gets, gets around and, and people give each, give each other tips. And while it is illegal, the enforcement is not really there. So because of that, um, you can actually beat the benchmark in Malaysia if you have access to information, right? Not saying that all fund managers in Malaysia in, you know, use insider trading, but it's definitely, um, as you can imagine with the culture here, information is a lot more porous. People talk to people and it's something that is a, a part of the industry. Yeah. So anyway, um, I'm going to use this opportunity to, to introduce what ETFs are. <clears throat> for, for, for those of you who haven't heard about ETFs, they are not some exotic financial instrument that, that, uh, that has just been invented. It's been around since the mid nineties. And it, it stands for exchange traded fund. It's like, it's like a unit trust, except that it's passive and not active. And by passive, I mean that it just mirrors a particular asset class or index um, and or a basket of assets. So if you buy a S&P ETF, you would have gotten the same result as just buying all the 500 stocks manually, right? So the ETF does a lot of this work for you already. You just buy one ETF and you have exposure to 500 plus stocks in the S&P 500. And it's also weighted in the correct way to represent the S&P index. You know, the large cap uh, stocks actually have a bigger weightage in the S&P. So it's a much easier way of building portfolios and it's a much cheaper way to get diversification as well. Okay, that because the ETF market is so well developed, there's actually over 5,000 ETFs uh, listed in the US alone. And because of, 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 of that, not all ETFs are necessarily passive. Okay, I'll talk about some of the passive ones first and then I'll touch on the active ones. So, so if, if you're passive, you're, you're, there's, there's so many types of ways to replicate something. So you can replicate a whole index or you can replicate a particular sector or you can replicate a asset class like, like bonds or, or, or gold. Um, and then you can also replicate like geographical exposure. So if you want all of, all, uh, like all of the Asian equities, you can just buy one ETF called, uh, the ticker is AAXJ, Asia X Japan. Um, in there, there's, there's thousands of stocks, which represents like all the major uh, stock markets in, in, in Asia. And you can imagine how convenient that is, right? So, so those are the passive ones. And then you have the active ones where just imagine a, a, a typical active managed fund, but it has uh, an ETF. You can actually trade it on a daily basis and you can go in and out and, and you can do it with ease. Um, you, you also have ETFs that, that are like smart beta type ETFs where they have some rules around some, some metrics maybe they are trying to get value, maybe they're trying to get momentum. And because of that, they, they screen the, the universe of stocks, whether it's in a particular market or not, to see whether these stocks that they have screened qualify with their quantitative uh, screening or not. 
And because of that, then they will include it or exclude it based on those rules. And they will refresh that every, every few months or so. So that is like semi-active as well. And then you have more exotic ETFs that are like, uh, like, like this inverse one over here, which does the opposite of what the index or market does. So if you want to short the market, you know, and you think that the market is going to, to, um, to go down, you can actually buy an inverse ETF because if it does go down, the, if the, ET, the ETF itself will actually do the opposite, which is go up and you can actually profit from that. Um, you can also buy leveraged ETFs where you can have 3x or 5x leverage. And what that does is if the stock market or the asset is trying to, to replicate goes up 1%, this ETF goes up 5%. So it sounds very exciting, but it goes on the other way as well, right? So if, if it goes down 1%, then you go down 5%. It's just magnified the other way, uh, the both ways. So if you think about it, all the market has to do for you to become zero is to go down 20%. So in a bear market, market goes down 20%, and you're five times leveraged, you go down 100%, you're done. You have no more money. Huh? So sounds inverse and all this exotic stuff sounds good until the market turns. So like I said, actually ETFs are not a new invention. It's not very exotic. Actually, it's been around for a very long time. And here are the big players in terms of issuing ETFs. You know, you have and, and index funds as well. You have your Vanguard, BlackRock, State Street Fidelity, and then um, everyone else. So index funds and ETFs account for four trillion US dollars in a market that is that is twenty trillion. So you have 20, 25 percent of, um, of of assets under management in relatively passive vehicles like this. So because of that, you can actually get an idea about how popular passive funds are, are becoming or have become. It is mainly because of fees at the end of the day. You know, a lot of fund managers disappoint and a lot of investors just want exposure. They don't want to necessarily pay more fees. And because of that, index funds have become very, very popular. Okay. So this is a view of how Stashaway builds portfolios and then manages them. So first we start with ETFs. Now that you know everything about ETFs, we pick the best ETF to represent each line over here. Taking a step back, you have, like I said, you have five main asset classes, right? Equities, bonds, real estate, commodities, and then you got cash, which you don't need an ETF for. So based on this, not all equities and bonds or real estate and all that are the same. So that's why we have so many sub categories here, over here. And it's because US equities and Japanese equities perform differently in different points in time. It's not like they are always positively correlated. So because of that, we have quite a lot, large selection here to choose from. We have around 30 ETFs to represent each of these asset classes over here. And because of that, we get to build portfolios in a very diversified way, but also to build portfolios to suit whatever economic environment we are in at any one point in time. I'll, I'll talk about that later on. So what we do is like Lego blocks, we take one, one of these ETFs to represent a particular asset class, and then we put it together in the portfolio to, to, to try and target a specific risk level. So if we want to build a very risky portfolio, Naturally, you take more Lego blocks from here versus here. If you want to have more pr protective, more safe portfolio, then, then you can we will choose more ETFs from here. So, so because of that, we get to build portfolios very quickly and to also target specifically some uh, a risk level. And because of that, um, we, we can offer uh, the 12 portfolios that we have. Okay. The difference between the bold uh, font over here and the light gray one is that these dark ones are the ones that we have chosen right now and are actually featuring in our, our portfolios as we speak. So it doesn't mean that we won't go to Australian equities or Canadian equities. It just means that right now they are not featured in the, our portfolios because when we go into the right 
phase of the economic cycle, we might change to them, right? But right now, in a, in a portfolio that is geared for uh, good times and also to, to take some, to take some uh, um, exposure in case things don't go well into like a recessionary type portfolio, we have all these dark ones here, okay? So at any one point in time, we could, could change this asset allocation by picking different ETFs to, to swap out some ETFs and to have their portfolio still represent the same risk, okay? So it's really easy to choose what, what, you, what portfolio uh, risk you want to take. You just take a slider and go up and down in our, on our website, and then you can see what the actual asset allocation is. And if you look at this um, bar charts over here, some of these bar charts could represent one ETF, like gold. Some could represent a few, like two or three, or, or even three in, in, in one. But at the end of the day, what you really want to have, like I was talking about before when I showed you the, the container ship, is really to, to see what your asset allocation is on a holistic level. So this is what we show here, okay? All right, so you might see as well, um, the way we label our portfolios is slightly different from others. So we don't want to market, uh, uh, returns because those are not guaranteed. We want to market risk. So we use this metric called value at risk, VAR, not the football VAR, but the investing VAR. And because of that, we get to label each portfolio with a certain uh, risk level so people know what they're getting into. So for example, if you're invested in the statutory risk index of 10%, it means that you have a 99% probability of losing less than 10% and a 1% chance of losing more than 10%. So as an investor, you're thinking like, why should I lose money, right? Obviously, I'm, saying not, I'm not saying that you will definitely lose either more than 10% or less than 10%. I'm saying that, that the maximum losses that you could experience in your time investing is very likely to not be more than 10%. It's a, if, you look to, if you took the distribution of returns over the, 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 the fund, the historical, the long back-tested kind of historical returns, and you look at all the losses, 99% of the time, the losses are not more than 10%. Okay? So it's also a way to ask yourself, am I willing to lose 10%? If you're willing to lose 10%, doesn't sound like a lot. And if I'm in it for long term anyway, then it should be fine. Then this 10% portfolio is for you. We have 12 different portfolios. The lowest one is 6.5. The highest one is 36. So if you're okay with potentially lo losing 36% of your money, then the riskiest one is for you. So for some people, it's perfectly fine. For, for others, it sounds like too much but essentially we give them the range so that we can choose, okay? All right, so here is a, a pie chart of how a statutory portfolio looks like where each line over here is represented by one ETF and then the weightage is really what makes up the, the, the risk, okay? So this is a statutory risk index of 6.5%. This is the most safe or most conservative portfolio that we have. You can see that actually equities is a very small portion, only 6%, and the rest are protective assets. You can see different kinds of bonds, gold included. So all this is, um, this, this is called, this is asset allocation in practice, okay? When you think about what percentage you should put towards what asset class, this is really the end product. So this is a, a safe portfolio. This is a balanced portfolio, 60% equities, 40% bonds uh, equivalent. You can see that the risk index is 22%. And you, because of that, you can see much more equities. You can see small caps, consumer discretionary, Chinese tech, US healthcare, and then the remainder in bonds and gold. Yeah. So this is something in the middle. Then you have a very risky portfolio, 
um, where you have mostly equities, is the only protective asset here is gold, 20%. You can see that all of this here are equities, and the only thing that's not equities is this REITs over here and the gold. So this is how portfolio looks like today, right? Having just come out of the COVID pandemic or coming out of the, the COVID pandemic, this is how it looks like. It doesn't mean that it will look like this forever. At any one point, our investment framework could tell us to change it, and that's, that's, that's when we'll change it. So I'll talk now about how we actually manage and change that asset allocation. What I've covered so far is essentially how we have, why we use ETS and how we build portfolios and how it looks like today, right? So when it comes to tech, a lot of the times startups will just shout about how amazing their tech is, you know, things like AI and machine learning and, and, and all this stuff. And really as an investor, as a client, as a consumer, you should ask yourself, what advantage does this tech give me? You don't want to just say, because the, the website said has all this jargon, has all this tech, it means it's good, right? So we try and steer away from that and we try and communicate what value that this tech actually brings to you. So when you think about what a robo advisor is, what is the robo part of it? This is the real robo part of it, okay? The real way of managing people's money digitally, okay? So how is it done in the past? You have a fund manager, maybe a CIO or a head of equities or a head of fixed income who will make, who will come to work, make decisions, instruct their team to do research. And because of that, um, that you have a very big team, right? So that one is traditional fund management. Robo-advisors really rely on algorithms. And again, that is a very big word, right? Because you might think like algorithm is like some sort of um, AI thing or not, but an algorithm is basically, it can be simple, it can be complex. One plus one is an algorithm, right? And what we use is a algorithm and a systematic way of investing. And the philosophy is that you will go through life going through boom and bust cycles. Economic students, business students, you will know that there's this boom and bust cycle. Asian financial crisis, uh, the, the tech bubble, you also have the global financial crisis. Uh, we, we just went through one as well, the COVID situation. You will go through seven or eight different cycles in your life. And it doesn't mean that your portfolio should look the same in a recession or in a good time or in times of inflationary growth or stagflation, which is why we have this investment framework which gives us the optimal portfolio to have in different times. So to put it very, very, you know, use a very simple analogy. If it's very hot outside, you wear shorts and a singlet. The moment it starts raining, you wear a raincoat, you have an umbrella. And if you travel and you go somewhere that's snowing, you wear a snow coat and you have different layers, right? So it's the same as your portfolio. Your portfolio shouldn't always look like this. This is what a portfolio looks like when we are here in good times, right? Because we have come out of the COVID situation. But if you go back one year in a recession, it shouldn't look like this because then you're taking too much risk, right? And you're exposing yourself to the wrong kinds of assets which don't do well in those situations. And then your investment performance, which is ultimately why people invest, won't be so good. So what I'm saying is that our portfolios switch from, from one asset allocation to another based on where we are in this economic cycle. And it won't always go like that. It could go from here to here. It could go from here to here to here, back to here, right? It could, it could, it could go one cycle, but wherever you are, there's already a pre-programmed portfolio waiting for you, okay? So the kinds of data we take in 
to assess where we are in the, in the economy is things like inflation. So naturally your CPI indicator is one of them. Other things like growth is better represented by things like industrial production. Or if you're really nerdy, you can look at the conference board leading economic indicator index, CBLEI. CBLEI or leading economic index is actually a very good composite of where the economy is headed or where the economy is right now, okay? And obviously, because we are a global fund, meaning we invest for you to get global exposure, we also look at things that are economic data that comes outside of the US, right? So we look at China, we look at uh, different indicators to build a composite of how the rest of the world looks like, all right? So based on that, it addresses this main problem. When you have, let's say you take away all the 30 different asset classes that we have picked, and you just focus on two, the S&P 500 equities and bonds, 20 year bonds. And you can see that in the different economic environments, they do differently. So in good times, you definitely wanna have more equities. In a recession, you definitely wanna have more bonds. In times of inflationary growth, you can split between the two. In stagflation, you definitely want more bonds as well. So if, if, if this world only had two asset classes, basically we would change our asset allocation from say 2080 to 8020 to like uh, 6040 to like 4060. So that's like the pre-programmed response. But obviously in this world, there's much more asset classes. So you get my point. So to be a little bit more granular, not very difficult, but also just a little bit more depth. I told you that we use ETFs and we use these ETFs to build portfolios, right? So each dot over here, this golden dot, represents one ETF. You have one here, AXJ, one here, consumer discretionary, one here, tech, and then you know the rest, you have S&P 500 over here. So you can see in good times, in terms of returns versus risk, these asset classes do very well. They, 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 they are more referred to commonly as cyclicals. So these equities do very well. And then you have bonds and gold, which do okay, but not very, not, not very well, right? Mostly like low single digits. So then we, we, we combine different combinations of these ETFs to then form our portfolios here from low risk to high risk to have returns from 5% up to, to say 12%. And these are expected returns, obviously. And you, you form what's called an efficient frontier. For those of you finance nerds, you will know that an efficient frontier is a representation of the best combination of assets given a certain amount of risk. So if you want to take 5% risk, this portfolio here is the best for you. Because if you, if you actually um, take on, a, a, like if you actually weight the portfolio with more cyclicals then, or more equities, then your risk will actually go up. And because you go up, your returns should be higher as well. So for example, if we just take uh, a portfolio of one ETF, forget seven ETFs, nine ETFs, you just take AAXG, in good times, it does 20% 20, uh, 20 returns, but it has also gives you 20% volatility, right? So, so that is very, very high. Normally, people cannot stomach like the, those swings. So while this return might be higher than here, you're actually taking on more risk. So that's why we have a combination of portfolios to form an efficient frontier. And if we go from good times to recession, you definitely want to change the asset allocation of your portfolio, where you now see these equities that did well in good times actually do terribly. Here is our friend, AXJ, volatility 25%, average return negative 20%. So because of that, we want to have less of these and more of the protective assets like gold, like these bonds over here, to form portfolios that in a recession can still give you decent returns. It's not gonna be as high as here, but at least it's still positive. 
So when we change the asset allocation, it would have more bonds and you can expect low single digit returns. So you'll see the efficient frontier also shifts from up here to down here. So the point is that if you invest in one portfolio here, you don't need to do anything. We will manage it for you, but your portfolio will go from here to here. And then in, in high inflation, you know, somewhere it will look somewhere like in the middle, stagflation will look differently as well. So we will change it according to where we are in the economic cycle. All right. So there we are. You have made it to the end. Congratulations. I, I don't think that it was that difficult to understand, but but if you were paying it, because if you were paying attention, you would see how it all fits together. And that kind of understanding may or may not be important to our investor. I can spend obviously one hour talking to them about ERA, which is our investment framework. I can tell them about ETFs and efficient frontier. But at the end of the day, people want to get along with their lives. People just want to know what should I invest in? You will manage it for me, correct? So we make it very easy for people to do that. They can actually choose to select their own portfolio or they can choose to, uh, to they can select this called, uh, this, this item called goal-based investing, where all they have to do is pick an investment goal that they have in mind and give us some inputs and then we recommend a portfolio for them. If you want to retire, when do you expect to retire? How much you want to draw during your retirement? How long you want this money to last? How much you have in EPF, right? Then your target is that when you retire in 30 years, you need 5 million, right? Then we, we give you a portfolio that suits that, okay? We also show you uh, your portfolio in detail. Each one of these things uh, represents ETFs. So we list down the ETFs for you and also show you the, the, the returns and the weightage so you know what you're invested in and what is pulling up your portfolio at one time, what is pulling down your portfolio at one time, just so you can get educated. And yeah, just here, here's uh, uh, this is this is our homepage. This is where you can monitor your returns. This is where you monitor your portfolio. And all you have to do is download the app, uh, sign up, which takes maybe like 15 minutes. And then you can deposit your money and you can monitor your returns and withdraw all from the app. And you don't need to fill up any forms and see people and all, all that kind of thing. So it's very, very simple. It's very, very easy. And um, just to close before we go into Q&A is my main message. My main message is that we are growing, we are expanding all the time. And because of that, we need young, bright minds like you guys we have open positions for full-time and also internships uh, most, most of the time. So because of that, uh, you, can, you should go to this website over here and check out what we have open. If you don't know what you want to do, it's also a very good place to find yourself and get exposed to the industry. We have a very young and vibrant team and the culture is actually very positive. It's, um, you learn a lot, it's very fulfilling. And um, just consider us when you're, when you're graduating or if you have an internship kind of a period during your, your semester breaks that you want to, to intern with us for a while. So just head over to this website and check out whatever uh, positions are open at that point in time. Okay, so that's it. Um, oh, someone, yeah, it took I, five minutes. I timed it out quite well. So let's go into Q&A then. Yeah, thank you, Waikun, for such an eye-opening session. So we will now move on to the Q&A session. Yeah, if you don't, the link will be sent in the chat box or you can scan the QR code in the share screen. So uh, why can you can start answering the question? 
Can you read it out? Just help me out a bit. Work, work for your salary a little bit. <laughs> you pick the question and uh, just read it out to me. And I'll ah, answer. okay. Um, uh, the first question is, as a student, is it better to start investing what little money we have or to wait until we start working and have a decent wage? Yeah, sure. So as a student, obviously, with what little you have, you can invest to learn about investing. It's not really about making like so much gains, right? Obviously, 10% on 100 bucks is not as exciting as 10% on a million bucks. But you should know that um, what you're like as an investor, you should know what platforms are available. You should know how to uh, interpret those uh, the, all the, the nitty-gritty statements and all that. You can also learn how to uh, control your emotions when you're investing, whether, whether you're up, whether you're down, how you manage that, right? So you're not an investor until you're invested. Sounds silly, but it's the truth. And you can learn all you can about investing without investing, but you don't really know what it's like until you have money on the table. It's the same as like swimming, right? Like you can watch all your YouTube videos in the world, but when you're in the pool, you still need to move your, your, your hand. You actually need to swim, right? So you move your hands and legs and actually start trying to swim. So I suggest, you know, looking at different platforms, including Sashaway. And there's a lot of options out there where you don't need a lot of money. You can start investing with like, uh, with a thousand bucks, there are a few platforms for you to choose from already. But you don't need a thousand bucks to, to necessarily start with Sashaway. But with a thousand bucks, you can actually like look at a few platforms. So if you look at, if you just search on YouTube, like investing RM1000, you will see a few actually like quite legitimate videos out there that, that actually give you all the options you, you can invest in with so-called very little money. So the next question is, should we follow social media to pick what to invest in? For example, the GME stocks inspired by Reddit. Uh, I don't think so. I think that's a sure way of losing a lot of money, actually. Um, I think that is very, very risky because if you think about the market, the market is an aggregate of all the investors, both smart and stupid. So the market is not always right. The market is just a collection of expectations about the future. It is not like a bunch of super brainy people deciding what is correct and wrong at any one point in time. That's why it, it's, it's possible to make money from, from the market. It's because certain people may get it wrong and you get it right. If you get it right, it means you make money. And I think this kind of social media investing style is actually very dangerous because you mostly hear about the ones that do very well. And if you did very well, I would congratulate you. I, I have no qualms against people making money in whatever way on the stock market. It's just that if you ask me, how am I going to invest you know, with a plan and all that, right? So if you tell me you want to gamble, which is fine as well. I'm not saying you shouldn't gamble. I'm saying like, if you want to gamble, you should win, right? But you obviously cannot assure that you will win. So if you want to invest, this is not the way to invest. But if you want to gamble, that is that this, this social media, Reddit stuff, Wall Street bets, that's a way to gamble. And when you're gambling, you also have to be very smart, right? So when you hear about all the gains and losses, this is other people telling you about their gains and losses. How you end up really depends on how you manage your money, right? So some people made money on the way up, people lost money on the way down, and then it went up again and people made money, and then it went down again and people lose money, right? So it is super, 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 super volatile. And because of that, your emotions, fear and greed will also be amped up super high. So if you're gambling, First of all, don't gamble with all your money. Gamble with like 5% of your money, 1% of your money, just for fun, right? You put 1,000 bucks there if you're worth 100,000. 
And then if this 1,000 becomes 5,000, then you tell yourself, okay, I've, I've, I've had enough. I, 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 am, I, I already got some gains. I'm out. I don't know how high it could go, but I also don't know whether it can crash. So because of that, I'm done, right? So that's how you gamble responsibly, right? So I think it's a very interesting evolution in the market. Don't get me wrong. But if you ask me whether you should do it, I think you shouldn't. But if you do, because you're the rebellious type, right? Then only do it with a bit. And when you make money, share it with your friends. <laughs> when you lose money, teach your friends, right? Because a lot of people in life, they just tell me when they make money. When they lose money, they are very, very quiet. So I, I, all, I, all I have to say is that Overall, in investing, everyone wants to hit the jackpot. And again, I'm using a lot of uh, gambling terms here, but that's a lot of what the mentality of people investing is like. Everyone wants to be in GameStop when it went up, Tesla when it went up, uh, Bitcoin when it went up. Uh, what else? Uh, the rubber glove stocks when it went up so much last year. But the thing is, if you're not an investor at all, Suddenly you hear about it because of the news, you're going to rush to go into it. By the time it's already too late. By the time it hits the news, it's already too late. So you, are, you will basically, if you do that, you will basically be going into the top of the market whenever you read the news. You'll be going to the top of the, the stock whenever it's in the news. So you'll be going from one hot stock to another hot stock, hoping that the hot will get hotter. But all you will endure is basically losses, 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 losses. You will need to be in the right position, actually hold the stock to be lucky. You cannot expect to be lucky if you don't hold the stock, right? So it, again, I don't know how many of you have been to the, the casino. And I don't really like to equate investing with the casino. But if you are trading for the short term, or basically gambling, right? And gambling, you can do it responsibly as well. So basically, if you are if you want to be lucky and hit the jackpot, then you know the, the roulette table with the, I don't know how many numbers, I think maybe 30 numbers or something like that. So imagine one stock as uh, number 15, and that is GameStop. So they roll the, the, the ball and if it lands on 15, then you would have made money. But if you put your money on other things, like 12 or 36 or whatever, you didn't hit it, then you're not lucky, right? So everyone wants to be lucky and hope that their 1,000 will become 1 million. And trust me, when you have 1 million, it won't be enough. You will, you're, okay, why your 1,000 becomes 10 million, and then you can go home and not invest at all. But to be lucky, you need to be in these opportunities. You need to be invested for a very long time. You need to know, okay, here's how I can gamble responsibly. Let me try and put a little bit of money on GameStop or Bitcoin. And then if it goes big, then okay. But you should also have a core portfolio that is safe, that is diversified, that you dollar cost average and invest for long term. So you can still meet your investment goals. If you have some discretionary income, some play money, some some, some, you know, you want to bet and you want to just like use this money for fun and invest in all this stuff and you want to gamble, just do it responsibly. Yeah. So I never, I would never ever chastise anyone for making money in whatever way in the stock market and investing. But it's more about the situation where you actually lose money and you do it in a very, very stupid way. Then and you feel free to cry and all that, but like that's that's on you, right? So it's not my fault. So the next question is, as a student or fresh grad, would you recommend for us to start investing as early as possible or only after we have saved up three to six months emergency fund? I think you can start investing in parallel, right? So maybe after you have like 
three months emergency funds, then you can already start investing. You don't have to wait until you have the full thing. As you have a very good safety net. Anytime anything happens, you can go back, live with your parents. You'll live with your parents until you get married. You don't have to buy food. You don't, some, some of you have a car given to you, right? So you start as, as early as possible because learning and getting your feet under you is more important than, than like losing money. If you lose money, so what? Maybe you lose 1,000. Maybe you lose 5,000. That's not the end of the world. When you start working, you're going to get three, four, five, ten thousand 10,000 already. So just learn. And the, the, the safety net really is more important when you are on your own, when you have a family. That's where you need six to 12 months. Actual cash and all that on the side. So you can do it in parallel, actually. Let's say you start working, fresh grad, you earn 3,000. The taxman takes some, EPF takes some, and you're left with maybe like two, five, right? So then maybe you put um, three, 400 towards your safety net. And then three, 400, you can put towards investing already. Um, it's not difficult. Like when I started working, I used to put 700 into, into my investing every month. Uh, and, and that would be something like, uh, actually, I, I would maintain that you need to invest like 30, 40% of your your, your net salary. So, sounds like a lot, but actually, if you think about it, what's your safety net? Right? Safety net is your parents and all that, so you're fine. It's only when you start being on your own where you're like, okay, instead of 40% investing, maybe I should dial it back. And at that time, you'll be earning more as well. You'll be earning like 10K instead of like 3K, 4K, right? So, you can maintain the, the, the percentage as long as you want. But at some point, you will have your own expenses. So then it cannot be 40% already. It needs to be like 20%. But at that time, the nominal number would be bigger because you're earning more. So just start, um, read up a little bit and, and invest in a couple of platforms and then, uh, and then learn from that, right? Yeah. Um, any recommendations for beginner-friendly resources to learn, from, uh, learn more about investments? And where do we start? Uh, yeah, I think a couple of sources. So I don't, I, I, I think you have to get your book recommendations from somewhere else because I feel like books get outdated very quickly. Um, but there's this uh, one book which was recently, <clears throat> I'm trying to look for it on my table. But it was basically released very, very recently. It's called The Psychology of Money. And it goes through uh you know the the good behaviors you should have while investing <clears throat> but i think that uh, very, very good resources are things like like bfm's podcasts so bfm has a lot of podcasts on its on its website and you can just search for different topics and it'll come up and then you can actually like look through re listen through like all the all the different content um there's one there's one segment called Ring It and Sense, which is mainly about personal finance because there have been many programs, right? So Ring It and Sense is, 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 is good for personal wealth. Also, there are some YouTubers, some YouTubers like Mr. Money or uh, Suyin, Suyin Invest, she's pretty good. Millennial Finance, also pretty good. Um, just start following them, listening to, listen to them. Have a bit of a skeptical healthy skepticism because you shouldn't always just do what they do, right? But you should just take their, their tips and, and do your own research. If they say, oh, you should use stash away, then like, then study stash away, learn, learn about stash away before you invest, right? Don't just like, oh, this trustworthy, handsome or pretty person said, I go and invest and I go invest, right? Don't be, don't be stupid. So make up your own mind, think independently. And if you agree with what their assessment is, then okay, then just do, Right? Because there's just so much to invest. So you need these people to like narrow it down. But to make a decision, you, you need to be accountable. Because if you make money, you can say, okay, I made this choice. If you lose money, you can also say, I made this choice. And then learn from it. Right? So, yeah. So this also answers the question for any recommendations book can we learn about invest and financial management? 
So yeah, the next plenty question. Of, there, plenty of uh, book recommendations out there, but I prefer more live, more 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 contemporary, more more recent kind of thing, right? So, and then if you do pick stocks, you should also read the edge like every day. You should read the edge every day. Get a PDF version, uh, and then follow these stocks very 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 closely. So next question, how should I build up my portfolio as a beginner? Should I consider the correlation of the stocks first? Uh, well, from the likes of you asking this, and, it, and this is no criticism to you, I'm just saying from, from the way that this question is asked, it sounds like you don't know a lot about investing. Um, and, and it just tells me that you should uh, learn more about stocks before starting. So the thing about stocks is that with a limited amount of money, it's very hard to buy uh, five to 10 different stocks, right? And you should definitely build your portfolio in a, in, a, in a methodical way. So you should understand what companies you're buying. You should also, yes, see whether they're correlated or not. So you should buy different, uh, in different sectors, large cap, small cap, but the main thing is about understanding the, the company. So if you're investing for the long term, you should understand the company's operations. If you're investing for the short term, you're trading, you should understand the, 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 the patterns that the stock price goes through where it determines whether you should go in or go out. So for, 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 that, for that person who asked the question, I would say definitely you should have a method of investing first before actually putting your money. So let's say your, your method is, I want to be a momentum trader, right? So you want to buy the stuff that's very, very hot and, and I want to trade in and out. So just follow a method and start by paper trading first. So you have an imaginary 10,000 bucks, where, what you should invest go onto Bursa's website and see what it is at any one point in time. Say, okay, I want to buy today, buy it at $10.50. And at 5 p.m., it is worth eleven sixty, dollars right? So what do you do? Buy more, sell, sell, what, what are you going to do, right? So follow your method and get a track record. And when your track record is, 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 is good, then, then when you should start investing for real. Okay. I think you can answer the first and second question together. So is it better to have one portfolio with say risk of 30% because I am young or should I split into a few, like for example, 18% and 24% to balance it out? And the next question was, do we need to change our portfolio risk when we are students as opposed to when we start working? Okay, so the risk index is really there to tell you what risk you're taking, right? So you should also have a different portfolio for different investment goals. So if you want to have one for a long-term goal, you should have a high-risk one. You should have a short-term goal for, for, uh, for a low-risk one, okay? So you shouldn't just say like, okay, I went a 30% and that's, that's, that's my, my thing. You should really tie it to a purpose, right? So if you are investing for the long term, it's like long term core portfolio, then you can just leave it in the 30. You don't need to split out because net net, they are the same risk anyway, right? So it's really up to you, but you should tie it to a purpose. So that's the first thing. So the second question is whether you need to change or not. I don't think you should change that much because, you know, in theory, you should take less risk as you go along, but the risk of of someone in 22 versus 28 is not that different. The, the risk someone, 20, uh, someone should take, whether they are 28 versus 50 is very different. So you should change like your risk, maybe like every five years or so. That's also a very fine tuning. Really. Like, like if you change it every 10 years or so, it's also okay. Right? So don't need to worry too much about, about the risk, especially in your first 10 years of working. 
Okay, moving on, people keep saying the recession is coming, collapse of economy due to COVID. So should I just keep my money in savings or go or invest? And where should we start investing as a student? Um, well, so you should understand what these people are saying. I don't just say people say, you know, I can say a lot of things, but I can say the economy is going to be great. I can also say the economy is not going to be great. I think really it's about having that, that long-term view about where you want to be after a certain period of years. So um, when you hear these talking heads on TV, they tend to be addressing what you should do in the short term, right? A lot of these people on TV are short-term players to tell you how to actively manage your portfolio. Oh, the, the, the vaccine was announced, let's buy Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca and Pfizer. And then, uh, okay, the vaccines are rolled up, you should buy banks and, and airlines. And then, oh, actually, there's some problem with AstraZeneca's vaccine or Johnson & Johnson. There's some defects and some blood clotting. So sell these, sell these banks and airlines that I told you to buy earlier and then buy something else. Maybe buy some defensives like consumer staples or uh, utilities. And also these faces change. So the faces change, so the views change. The views change means that you're going to be schizophrenic, right? Every time you turn on CNBC or, 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 or Bloomberg, you're going to be like, this Kuala said that, this Chinaman said that, this lady said that, then you're going to be like, oh, what should I do, right? So that at the end of the day, know that financial media is still media and it's no better than, you know, tabloids and all that, right? Because it's really there to keep you glued to the market, excited about the market, so that you keep watching. They don't care whether you make money or lose money. They, they care whether you watch. So what makes you watch? exciting developments that are happening in the market. So because of that, if you, if you read the financial news, just get the facts. Like, okay, there's a ship being stuck in the Suez Canal. Or there's this family office that went bust. There's this Chinese bond issuer that went bust. Okay. Or what, the, you know, what, what Biden is doing with his tax plan. Or that. Just get the facts. In terms of the sentiment, you must check with your own self and what you feel about this and whether you should change your portfolio or not. If you actually zoom out, all this just determines the short term up and down. But if you zoom out, actually the S&P and global markets actually just trend upwards slowly. So, you know, you really shouldn't care about it if you're a long-term investor. Um, and, and, and actually, you're, since you're so young, you can withstand the next two recessions or whatever crises so whenever you see a crisis just buy more stocks just buy more buy more of the s p buy more etfs whatever platform you use just invest more if you go through a cycle uh, 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 end of the world right so yeah i wouldn't change my asset allocation now based on the fact that just like someone says oh it's gonna end so i buy gold you should always have a portfolio with a little bit of gold in it so that it, it, it shields your portfolio from downside. So you shouldn't be jumping from one asset class to another. You should have a diversified asset, asset class to begin with. And then if you want to, like Stash Way, if you want to change certain things from time to time, you can. But you shouldn't do it just because someone said on TV, you should do it because you have a view. And if you don't have a view, that is better, honestly, it's better to have someone else manage your money. So moving on to our last question, understanding that stash away returns are not as high as investing in stocks, why should we invest in stash away? Well, it's the same as, well, first of all, I wouldn't say, say that stash away returns are not as high as investing in stocks, right? Because it depends on what, what stocks you earn, whether and how much you how much you make. And what I will say is that stash away is not as volatile as stocks, right? So I wouldn't necessarily say that the returns are not as high. 
from our investments since our inception, we have done anywhere, our safe portfolio has done 3.5%. Our risky portfolio has done 17% per annum. So if you pick your own stocks, I will also ask you, can you generate 15 to 17% every year, right? And you might think, yes, because if I have one stock that just moves up 20%, I win already, right? But you have to do this year in, year out. And if you have a stock that goes, you know, you have a portfolio, right? And if one goes up 20% and one goes down 5%, then you have to blend that together, right? So I'll say it's not as volatile, but it doesn't mean that it's not as the returns are not as high. I think you should invest in statutory because essentially it's a service. Why should you grab instead of taking, driving your own car? Why should you have a maid instead of cleaning your own house? You should use statutory because essentially you want to invest globally. It's very difficult. You need a lot of money. And you don't really know because you're not an expert in terms of like when you should change your portfolio and all that, whereas we are. It's the same like any other fund manager. Like why should you use them? Why should you just manage your own money, right? If you are very good at managing your own money, you wouldn't need any of these people. You wouldn't need me. But if you're a busy person, you're, you don't want to spend your time looking at stocks. And even if you are, and you want to further diversify by having global exposure, you, you won't know every single stock all around the world. You might be an expert, or you might like to think you're an expert in one particular market, let's say the US market or Malaysia market, but you still need other platforms to diversify yourself, right? So two types of people use Dash Away. And actually it's, it's what we see. Like. People who are beginners and people who are like quite savvy already. The savvy ones use us because they want to diversify. They are experts in things that they already know, like real estate or Malaysian stocks, but they want to want to diversify even further by having global investments. So figure out whether such way is useful to you or not and use us only if it's useful. If you're a superstar stock picker, then you don't need us, right? But if you, if you are not an expert and if you want to learn and you want to get exposure overseas, whatever reason, then, then you're yeah, perfect. But it's really, the, it, what, from what your question is asking, it's really the decision on whether you want to do it yourself or you want to have someone else do it for you, right? Which is a service, yeah. Okay, thank you for answering all the participants' questions. So now we will move on to the photo shoot session. So if you don't mind, participants, you can turn on your webcam for us to take a picture. I'll wait a few minutes for you to turn on your camera. Okay, so on my count, three, two, one. I'll go to the next page. Three, two, one. Okay. That's all. Uh, Faris? Yep, and that is all for the second session of our Financial Literacy MSG Academy. Thank you, everyone, and thank you to Waiken for being our guest speaker for this morning. And I hope you all have a very good day. Thank you very much. And before you. we leave, uh, please fill up the feedback form for us to improve for our future events. And just a short reminder, we have our next FinTech session on 1st of May, 11 a.m. So the participants do remember to join for you to get the certificate of participation.
Okay, thanks to everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Waiken. Thank you, Waiken.